Hey guys, don't forget to check out the Street Cop Training Conference 2023, April 23rd through the 28th, Nashville, Tennessee, the Gaylord at Opry. What a center, what a place. We have amazing speakers, amazing training, five of the most impactful days of your career. Check it out at streetcop.com. You do not want to miss out. There is a room code available for a discounted room. Sign up now at streetcop.com. Hey guys, welcome to this episode of the Street Cop Training Podcast. I'm your host, Dennis Benito. I'm the founder and CEO of Street Cop Training. I actually said that a little backwards this time, but I'm trying to shake it up for everybody. Today with me, uh, your favorite and my favorite case law guru. You'll see him in our Facebook group all over the place. The man, the myth, the legend, the freshly haircutted Zach Miller. Hey, good to see you. Good to be here. Always a pleasure, my friend. And what are we talking about today? Um, uh, well, it looks like, um, we're going to talk about maybe a little bit of search incident to rest. Um, we've got some exclusionary rule exceptions that we might get to, um, and some, uh, I guess, I guess the first ones we should probably talk about are the, the cases that you mentioned, the, um, minor arrest situations, um, like hedge, hedge path, the, the French fry eating girl on the subway. Out. Yep. Yeah, I, when I didn't recognize the case when you first mentioned it, but as soon as I pulled it up, I was like, ah, yes, I remember this one. Yes. Oh, it's a good one. Imagine um, that. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, they all go back to um, Atwater versus Lago Vista, which is a Supreme Court case that basically says that if you have probable cause that a violation has occurred, whether the state law allows a custodial arrest or not, under the Fourth Amendment, it's a lawful arrest. Um, so what does that mean? Can we unpack that a little bit? Like, what does that mean for a local officer? You can't take that and run with it, right? Oh yeah. Cause you could, yeah. So this is just, we're just strictly talking about the fourth amendment reasonableness of the arrest. So all that means is you can't be sued under 1983 for violating someone's fourth amendment rights and the federal exclusionary rule does not apply, but there could be, there still could be state law ramifications for if you arrest someone for an offense in your state that doesn't allow for an arrest because of state law, you still could be held liable in a civil lawsuit in under state law, uh, maybe for, for a battery, uh, for an illegal arrest or some kind of malfeasance in office suit. So yeah, it doesn't, it is not in any way the Supreme Court condoning violating state procedural law. Um, but it doesn't violate the fourth amendment. So um, look, we can talk about hedge path. It's a really good example. Um, I just want to say this. I want to jump here and say that Atwater is probably one of the most uncomfortable cases I've ever read in my life. Uh, to I don't know. I wasn't there. I'm not Monday morning quarterback, but I'm like, oh, God, why would you do this? Who cares well, how much of a bitch she was, right? I would say it was probably the most uncomfortable until you get the hedge path. And, until you get to the girl right, eating path. a French fry. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, both of these cases. So Atwater versus City of Lago Vista is a Supreme Court case. And then Hedgepath versus uh, City of Wa- Washington, D.C., I think the Metro Transit Metro Authority Transit. Metro Transit, right. and the District of Columbia were sued um, in the district court, the first, the, 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 federal, the Washington, D.C. District Court. Um, both of them involved arrests for very minor offenses, like, like things like citation offenses, things you would traditionally write someone a citation for. In Hedgepath, I guess there's a, a rule that you can't eat and drink in the subway system. Um, the zero so, tolerance policy, right? Yeah, so for some reason that's that's against the rules. And at the time of this of offense, there was the, the Metro Transit Authority had a zero tolerance policy in effect for uh, juveniles eat, uh, smoking, or excuse me, eating and drinking on the subway. And apparently under DC law, you cannot, you cannot write a citation to a juvenile unless it's a traffic offense, meaning you have to take them into custody if they commit a, a violation. So a 12 year old girl, uh, Hedgepath was her last name, was, was caught eating a single French fry on the subway system and she was arrested taken into custody because she was not, they couldn't, the, the officer was not allowed to write her a citation because it would have been against the law. And the zero tolerance policy says violation, she's going to get charged. Took her into custody, eventually released her to her parents. Um, the family ended up suing the police department or the Metro Transit Authority in the city of Washington 
um, for, for a Fifth Amendment issue, which is not relevant here, that's an equal protection violation because, because an adult would have gotten a citation was the argument. So she's being discriminated against or treated unequally because of her age. Um, so that case, that was actually not a basis for a legitimate lawsuit here. And the, the, what we're talking about for our purposes, it was a, the allegation was the violation of the Fourth Amendment because it was a citation only offense. Uh, it, she should not have been arrested. It was unreasonable to arrest a 12 year old girl in those circumstances and eventually goes to the DC court of appeals. Uh, and just ironically, the judge that wrote the opinion is, or interesting, uh, interestingly, I should say is, was John Roberts, chief justice, now the current chief justice of the U S Supreme court. Uh, he was on the, dish, the DC court of appeals at the time. He wrote the opinion to Hedgepeth that said the fourth amendment was not violated. It was a very minor offense. He, we all agree with that. Um, maybe as a policy matter, it wasn't a wise idea to arrest her, but the officer had clearly probable cause that she violated the law. And that is the only requirement for the Fourth Amendment for a lawful arrest is the existence of probable cause. And Hedgepeth cited Atwater, um, where the Supreme Court kind of has already addressed this issue. The, the, the District Court of Appeals is, was bound by the decision in Atwater that they had to hold, uphold the, the lawfulness of the arrest. So the arrest was lawful. Um, even though it might not have been a wise thing to do. And I guess they changed their policy after this um, regarding juveniles and, and zero tolerance. But uh, the takeaway message is it doesn't matter how minor the offense is, uh, as long as the officer has probable cause, a custodial arrest would be lawful under the Fourth Amendment. And that means right. so any evidence you find on them would not be excluded um, in a criminal trial. But again, just to remind people that your state law could restrict and probably does restrict your position to arrest anybody for anything or any violation of law. We're talking about under the Fourth Amendment. And also, I want to ask you this question. I also want people get confused that you could never arrest somebody for a minor offense. Zach, are there aggravating factors that might allow you, maybe at first on the surface, to not arrest somebody, but to cite and release them. But then because there was criteria that was met, maybe judicial rules or some case law, that now you were in a position to arrest them to maybe identify them. Is that appropriate? Yeah, so what I'm, I'm saying I wanna... is you, in New Jersey, for example, you would have somebody stopped on a motor vehicle violation. If they had good identification, we couldn't arrest them under our case law and our state statutes. For the motor vehicle violation, citing kind of Atwater stuff, uh, we couldn't just take you to jail because you didn't wear your seatbelt and you have a good, a good idea. However, once we found out that you may be hindering, I'm going to dial it back even a little bit. The court dictates that you believe the person is going to thwart or obstruct the criminal justice process, and they're not going to respond or they're mm -hmm. not going to respond in response to a summon to, summons to court because the, the identity of the subject is in question. Uh, what we say is at this point now with that, you're allowed to make the arrest. We need those aggravating factors to now give police the authority to arrest for a motor vehicle violation, such as a um, as and a minor one at that, as, as not wearing a seatbelt or littering. Uh, but we, that same case law, interestingly enough, says that you can arrest for more significant or severe motor vehicle violations like driving while suspended or uh DWI is a motor vehicle law offense in the state of New Jersey. It's not a criminal charge. It's actually a motor vehicle violation. It comes up in your driver abstract. Uh, mm -hmm. Or leaving the scene of an accident. No injury necessary. Merely leaving the scene of an accident with property damage only now elevates it to the give the police the authority or power to actually place somebody under arrest for just that offense alone. Make sense? Yeah, yeah, a lot of states have carve outs like that, um, like for Virginia, for example, um, where I work. Yeah, um, a, a misdemeanor that and this includes traffic offenses, misdemeanors that occur in the presence of the officer. The, the state law is you shall issue them a summons or a citation if you're going to charge them. Unless you have a, for example, a reason to believe the person won't show up in court. They're actually listed in the code. The officer has a reason to believe they won't show up in court. Um, if it's a criminal summons, they refuse to sign the summons. Um, you have a reason to believe they're a danger to themselves or others if you leave them. All of these would justify taking them to jail instead of releasing them on a summons. So it sounds like very similar thing you have there in New Jersey. 
Um, lots of states have those carve outs for, yes, we want to citate and want you to write citations for this. However, there could be aggravating factors um, such as the ones that you and I both mentioned that could justify taking them into custody. Um, but for Fourth Amendment purposes, you can take them into custody without any of those aggravating factors. Um, even though you are violating state law, potentially, you're not violating the federal constitution. Um, and again, neither one of us nor the, nor the Supreme Court are advocating violating state law because the consequences could be severe, severe for the officer. And maybe there is a state exclusionary rule that, that does apply to those situations. In Virginia, for example, we don't have a statutory exclusionary rule for situations like that. And we, you mentioned Virginia versus Moore. Maybe we'll get to that in a little bit. That's a perfect example of what I'm talking about, um, where the rest was illegal under state law. They found some drugs in his pocket. The Supreme Court said those drugs are admissible as a valid search incident to arrest because the arrest was lawful for Fourth Amendment purposes because the officers had probable cause. What's the next topic we're moving on to? I don't know. Do you want to talk about, um, you said you mentioned Evans and Herring? That's one. Yeah, people are um, asking me. So I try to listen to what people are asking me in the field of mm -hmm. direct messaging and instant messaging. And if I haven't gotten to your message and you're listening to this, it's because I get a shitload of them. And I'm a human being trying to run a company. And I also have a personal life as well. And I do have to disengage at some point of the day to be a father to wonderful, wonderful children. Um, so please don't take this as an invite to personally DM me and ask me your legal advice. And if you really are in a situation that you need answers, can you please just Google it first and see if you can't come up with it on your own? Uh, maybe ask a local advisor. And if there's really some confusion, Zach and Dennis may be available at that point. But, you know, try to dial it back a little bit because I know, Zach, you're getting crushed, right? I, I get a lot of them. And I, uh, emails and messages and, and texts. And I try to answer as, as, as many as I can. But I, I'll be the first to admit I don't get to all of them and certainly don't do them all in a timely manner. But, um, yeah, it can be a lot. Yeah, I mean, if you are really experiencing something that is significant and it's an emergency, and I'm not saying because you're a nut and you think it's an emergency. I'm talking about a real emergency. Run it, if you're crazy and people say that you're crazy, run it past your friends first <laughs> and then let them decide if this is actually an emergency where you need street cop training to come in and give you legal advice. What's an example of one? You're going to get fired. You're going to get indicted and you think you did the right thing and you think they're citing improper law and you need help. Because your union defense attorney uh, is a complete hack. We're here for you. We'll help you if we can. That's an emergency situation. What's not an emergency? You and your friends are sitting at the bar having a debate, and you've all drank in way too much Johnny Walker Black. Yeah. I don't, I've, I'm not lying to you. I've literally gotten calls, and, I, and people are like, we got, we got a question for you. We're sitting around here talking. I'm like, are, are you guys fucking drunk? <laughs> right. I, my right. hands. Do you remember that one? Do you remember that time? We had to call yeah. you. I don't want to say this. He, he yes. hammered. And the next day I said, were you drunk? How drunk were you? Like, oh, yeah. yeah, we were fucked up. I go. And we're just running in. So, you know, like when you draw, talk to a drunk person as a cop and they just like not hearing you. Yeah. Same right. thing happens too when you're talking to a drunk cop. They're not hearing what you're saying either. So they're not going to so. remember anything you said. So, yeah. <laughs> All right, let's go into yeah. that, that second one. Yes, um, so uh, Evans, I think it's Arizona versus Evans and uh, Herring versus the United States. These are both uh, exceptions to the exclusionary rule. Um, Evans was a case where an officer, uh, I think it was on a traffic stop, and he just ran the license of the driver and found out had an outstanding warrant. So the officer placed the person under arrest did a search incident to arrest and found drugs or something in the car or on the person, something like that. We'll come to find out before he gets to the jail, that warrant had been quashed. So a judicial, some, some clerk and some uh, judge, excuse me, in some courthouse made a clerical error. Uh, the warrant had already been served or quashed or something like that. The point is it wasn't a valid warrant. And so the question was, is the physical evidence that the officer discovered during search incident to arrest, is it admissible? And the Supreme Court in uh, Arizona versus Evans said, yes, it is admissible uh, when the mistake is made by a judicial clerk. The reason for the exclusionary rule, which is to deter illegal police conduct, doesn't apply. 
So there's no there's no illegal police conduct to deter mm. when the officer is relying on what he's told by a clerk is a valid warrant. So when the clerk makes a mistake and the officer relies on that mistake uh, and finds evidence uh, on, on his person, for example, that's not going to be excluded from from trial. What about me? Like, so I'll get this question a lot. Hey, we get a warrant on a guy. We arrest him and then we're waiting to confirm the warrant. What yeah. happens if the warrant comes back and it's not active? That's different. So that's so this one in, in Evans, they got confirmation or at least the initial confirmation. And then somebody did some follow up and found out it was quashed. When uh, I'm, I can just speak for the the visas, the NCIC training we receive in Virginia. And I imagine it's the same everywhere in, in this in the country because it's the same database. When you get a hit on an on a license return or something like that, hey, this person has a warrant out of so and so jurisdiction. The training specifically says that is reasonable suspicion to detain the person. It is not by itself until it's confirmed. It is not probable cause to place the person under arrest. That's the that's the reason we have the confirmation process. So you get this hit um, that this person likely has a warrant out of so and so jurisdiction. Then someone from that jurisdiction has got to confirm yes, we have this warrant. That once you receive that confirmation, that's the probable cause to make the arrest. So when you get a hit and then you just immediately place them under arrest without confirming it, uh, unless they're under arrest for something else, that's an unlawful arrest. This is a major yeah, so unlock. That, it's a, one of the biggest mysteries in law enforcement. And it's, it says it right in the training that you receive when you initially get your sort of your access to, to the NCIC database. It's enough to detain the person, but it is not enough to place them under arrest to get that confirmation. So if you search them while you're detaining them, like you do a full blown quote, search incident to arrest, find drugs on their person and then come and find out, oh, the warrant, no, we're not going to extradite or this is not a valid warrant. That evidence is inadmissible. Okay. That's not the same thing as the mistake. There are that, literally yeah. going to be 375,000 people going, oh, wow, this was good. This was really what is profound moments in my career where I know we just helped a lot of people. How about this on a quick side note while Zach was saying that? If you think that they have something on their person, I'm articulating and arguing to you that you should not search them illegally. You can search them legally. There are other exceptions to the warrant requirement under the Fourth Amendment. One of those is consent. Uh, so I would I would argue that maybe if you're in a situation like that, going for a consent search of somebody's person would be a far better route than rolling the dice and hoping this thing comes back confirmed. Absolutely. Right. Because if it does come back confirmed, you're good to go. But you're right. You're rolling that dice that they're actually going to confirm this warrant, or especially if it's an out-of-state warrant. Those are not all extraditable. Um, so yeah, you can go for consent if you've got reasonable suspicion. They've got a weapon on them. You can pat them down. If you have probable cause to believe they've got drugs or contraband on them, then you could probably search them as under an exigent circumstances theory. But it's definitely not search incident to arrest until you've gotten that warrant confirmation. Excelente. Yeah. What was the follow up one to that? Um, so Herring, United States versus or Herring versus the United States was kind of the same thing as Evans, same fact pattern. Uh, officer gets confirmation that there's a warrant for an outstanding warrant. So he places a Herring under arrest, searches and finds drugs on his person. Come to find out a short time later, that warrant uh, had was mistakenly left in the database. I guess it had maybe been served earlier or quashed, but a a, a police employee, like a civilian employee of a police department had made this mistake. This police employee had failed to take the warrant out of the, the database. So the difference here, uh, remember Evans was a judicial employee. There's no deterrent effect for the exclusionary rule when the mistake is made by a judicial employee. Well, what about a police employee? And the Supreme Court said the same thing. This evidence is admissible. Uh, the mistake, as long as it's an isolated mistake, meaning this agency isn't routinely making mistakes like this, as long as it's an isolated mistake, even if it's a police official who made the mistake about the existence of the warrant, the evidence is still admissible. So Herring and Evans deal with mistakes as to the existence of warrants. Uh, the mistake is made by somebody, not the officer. So it's not the officer making a mistake. It is some um, civilian employee who's made the mistake. Okay. I think our final one is Maryland v. Bowie. 
Um, oh yeah, another the U.S. versus right. Ford or Ford v. U.S. Uh, and then following, I'm I'm assuming we're going to touch on Michigan v. Long and Arizona v. Gant, and hopefully just touch on those to try to give some clarity. And I'm going to tell you the premise that I get constantly. We've addressed it in previous podcasts. It's, hey, I'm told I can wingspan search cars when I arrest people next to them. No, <laughs> so. <laughs> A, a wingspan search. If you well, if you tell me, if you say you're going to do a, you're looking to do a wingspan search of a car. I'm thinking you're talking about a weapons frisk because mm. that is what it is. Now, that's Michigan versus Long. That's when you have a. That doesn't have anything to do with the person being under arrest. It just means you got a lawful stop and you have a reasonable suspicion, but there's a weapon in the car. Right. You then can you articulate can search, that. You have to be able. To, yeah, you have to be able to articulate that belief. And then you can search basically the lunge area, the wingspan of the occupants, anywhere. People a weapon think you get this as a as a bright line rule no. that if you arrest somebody next to the next to the car, you get a wingspan search, and they're getting confused with a buoy search. Right. So buoy. So all right. So long as the weapons search has nothing to do with arrest. In fact, if they're under arrest, long doesn't apply anymore right. because they're not right. going back to the car. Correct. Buoy is an offshoot of Chamel, which is the modern search incident to arrest case, Chamel versus California, uh, which says that you are allowed incident to arrest to search the immediate area around the arrestee looking for um, dangers or threats to the officer or evidence that could be destroyed. Okay. So buoy is a house search case incident to arrest. So if you arrest someone in a house, Bowie says, Bowie actually says two things. You get to search the immediate area uh, of the arrestee looking to make sure there's no people. So for example, if I arrest somebody in a, like a living room and there is an adjoining kitchen, like right next to the living room, Bowie says, I'm allowed to look in the kitchen. I'm allowed to just walk over to the opening the doorway to the kitchen and look in the kitchen to see if there's any people inside. And I don't have to have a reason to believe there's people there. So Bowie says adjoining rooms, we get a free cursory, just quick glance to make sure there's no people there that could um, hinder or, or obstruct the arrest. And then Bowie goes one step farther, talking about in a house, you can also do a sweep of the house looking for people meaning rooms beyond the adjoining rooms, if you have a reason to believe there's people in the house who could pose a threat to you. And you just so can't I can go upstairs. hyperbolize. Yeah, you can't, you just can't say, well, when we go to a house, we always have a belief that somebody might be in the house. Agreed? That doesn't work. That's not going to fly, right? It has to be particularized to these facts. Why not only people in the house, but people who could be a threat. So just because there's two kids sleeping up in the bed, bedroom upstairs, that, and you know they're up there, that doesn't mean you have a belief that they're a threat. So you don't just get to walk upstairs and kind of look around the house for people. You got to have a reason to believe there are people who pose a threat. Then you can go and sweep the house looking anywhere a person could be. And of course, these issues come up when we find things in plain view, mm -hmm. like drugs and other contraband doing the, during these sweeps. So Bowie says the immediate adjoining areas, free peak, if you will. Uh, no reason to believe there's people there. You don't have to have that. But to go to beyond that and do the rest of the house, you've got to have RS that there are people who present a threat. And people have to understand that when you're going into a house with an arrest warrant, armed with an arrest warrant, uh, whether it's misdemeanor or felony, your objective, correct me if I'm wrong, is to grab a body that is the person associated with the arrest warrant, secure them and remove them from the house. Your objective yes. is to go in, grab the person, secure them, remove, bring to justice, correct? Exactly. If, if the only reason I'm in there is to affect this arrest, then once that arrest has been affected, the person's been handcuffed, secured, and searched, we're out. Yep. You, you're you're under a duty to, to leave the residence. Right. Right. Our, our purpose for being there has now been fulfilled. Now our next goal is to get out of the house. And, yes. and again, minus any now other circumstances that may have arisen probable sure. cause and under plain view uh now you're going to secure the residence and go apply for a search warrant or even ask for consent maybe if that's the case but people need to know guys and girls it's so important and so vital to 
understand, appreciate, respect, and uphold the Constitution of the United States of America. Whether or not you like the way this sounds or it's different from the way you've been doing things, that is irrelevant to what we are telling you. What You like when we say some shit like this, but you don't like when we say some shit like this. It doesn't matter. These are the rules, and we are telling you you must follow them. You may not like it. I had a guy wrote a comment like, I feel like you guys are educating uh, criminals. How about we got to educate cops first, right? Like you, why don't you guys, cause guess what's going to happen when you don't know what you're doing, you're going to find yourself in a courtroom trying to justify the actions you took based on that. Well, that's what I thought. It doesn't work. You can't just, yeah, just say what, what I, I thought. Just what I thought is not a defense. So, no. and, and last time I checked every law enforcement officer in the country takes an oath of office One of those promises that you make during that oath is you raise your hand and you swear you will uphold and defend the United States, the Constitution of the United States, not just the parts that you like. Right. The whole thing. So rules, man, play by the the rules we have to follow. Right. Guy said the other night, he goes, I had this car. He goes, I'm friends with this guy that had had this car stop. I, I think there was a gun in the car. Here's why dog came out. Dog did not alert. Um, What was my other options? And I said, none. That was it. It was over. Once that you had reasonable suspicion, I will give you that. And certainly we don't know if it's a what you're going to find in the car, because we know that now you get into a psychological game of proactive patrol and stuff like that. Something was wrong. That's what you have to articulate. If you knew it was drugs, then you wouldn't you wouldn't need a dog to come out. Um, You had plenty of reasonable suspicion. I will submit to that. But your last effort was to bring a dog out under suspicion that it could have been narcotics. The dog did not alert. And we have hit a point in this we have no other probable cause it is time to move on lick our wounds and wait for the next time that's it exactly yeah that's those are the do? rules you can't, you can't win the whole i know you and i both know there's a fucking gun in the car right but you gotta follow right. the rules you right. gotta follow the rules because the minute you get caught not following the rules it's over babe and you're 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 done your job's over and you might find yourself going to prison and i don't want that to happen so you've got to understand that you have to concede that it's not going to go your way every single time. But what you can say at the end of the day is that I uphold the Constitution of the United States of America. Yeah, our, our job is to enforce the rules against those who don't follow the rules. So it's certainly implicit in that obligation that we will first follow the rules that we have to follow. And that's what the Constitution is. That's that's the foundational rule right there is the federal Constitution. Those are the foundational rules that we have to follow. And then you have all of your state laws that you have to follow and policies and everything. So, yeah, it's yeah. So you're not going to win all of them. And, that, and that's perfectly fine. That That's the trade off society has uh, agreed to accept. When we said why well, I followed up a little bit with U.S. versus Ford was it was an interesting case, because in that case, they are serving an arrest warrant. Correct. And then as they're taking him out, he goes. Something along the lines of, yo, they got me. They got me. Something like that. That was enough reasonable suspicion in the court's eyes to now perform your cursory search of the house looking for. Whole house. Yeah. That, yeah. That's a perfect example of what Bowie was talking about. Reasonably, there's a, a threat in the house. Absolutely. Yeah. And then you, and you get the whole house. You get you get to sweep the whole house looking in places a person could be. Right. That doesn't mean opening drawers and then you're going to articulate right. later on there could have been fairies right. inside or little people and things like that. Yeah, unless you have a reason to believe there are actually little people in this house, this particular house, I would say no, probably not. Yeah, it's going to be a whole, be a yes. tough one. And that would make yeah. some good case law for us to read. Yeah, sure. these circumstances is, uh, and then people, you know, look, we're trying to help you guys interpret and understand what the law says. That's what these podcasts are about. And mm-hmm. I know a lot of people are finding a lot of value in them. And, you know, now you can comfortably take action when it's appropriate when it's lawful, when it's justified, and not continue to just play this like a big frigging guessing game, you know? What else do we got today, Zach? I think that's I it, think, right? You know, that was it. I think I got that's I got everything checked off that you had on the list. So I think it's a I good. Think, this is a great episode. Yeah. yeah, we got we covered a lot, a lot of good stuff. Zach Miller and our other law enforcement. Um, I got to bring on more of the, our guys onto the podcast and give them an opportunity to show their skills. Uh, but these guys are covering, you know, we're covering about 20 to 25 states now. So if you're in a state that we're actually attending to Texas, Florida, California, there's a lot of them, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Ohio, Indiana, New Jersey, Connecticut, check out some of these classes. They're very, very powerful. They're non-controversial. And it literally is us explaining to you how the law works and how to apply it in the field to find where you can 
check out Zach's classes, go to streetcop.com. Look under his classes, find Zach Miller, do a little leg work. He's got a lot of stuff coming up and it's very successful. We're actually getting amazing feedback and the classes keep increasing in size every time we return and they're significantly sized classes. Zach doesn't show up and teach eight or 14 people. They're double digit, sometimes triple digit classes because this is the information that's very vital to law enforcement's ability to go out and perform this job appropriately. Zach, do you have anything else? Nope, I'm good. We'll, we'll do it again just soon. Off to my wedding, brother. I will see you. Not my wedding, but you know, I'll see you. Yeah, I got you. Have fun.